It, it was really awesome experience. It was, uh, yeah, it, it, you can't, uh, you can't, there's no substitute for working with someone like that. An all new episode of The Jeremy White Show. Available wherever you stream. Catch up on past interviews and episodes on demand now. Subscribe so you don't miss any of it. Yeah, the guy, uh, well, he was a legend to us. You know, that's yeah. why that's why we were reaching out to him. And it, it was just really, you know, it, it's, it's really kind of funny because a lot of the things that we did in the studio prior to meeting Mutt was things that we learned from listening to albums that he had produced. And we had, you know, kind of in a way taken ourselves to Mutt School before we met Mutt and, you know, learned some of those, some of those things, you know, some of those production techniques that, that he uses and had incorporated them on our records. And it was just a complete happenstance. I think my brother was in a studio somewhere working on some session. I don't even think it was one of our sessions. I think it might've been a Santana session or something like that. And, and, you know, just said, you know, they were just having conversation around the console while they were working. And he's like, said something about how great Mutt Lang is. And the guy's like, well, would you ever think about working with him? And my brother's like, of course, you know, and and the guy goes, well, a good buddy of mine's actually working with him like right now. And then he goes, well, I talk, tell him, we would love to talk. And, and it was as simple as that. Uh, there was, you know, the text message went through to wherever in Switzerland, they were working probably at Mutt studio. Yeah. And, and, uh, the word came back, Mutt said, Hey, here's my number. Give me a call. And, and that's how it works because Mutt, the thing about Mutt is he's kind of like, like an evil genius. He, he doesn't, Mutt doesn't have a manager. He doesn't have an agent. He doesn't have a representative. He doesn't have a website. He doesn't, even really have a phone number for any prolonged period of time. He's really shadowy. So you don't find him. He finds you. Yeah. He, he's an, an enigma for yeah. sure. So when we finally made contact with him and, and, uh, and then my brother went over just to show him a couple of songs over in Switzerland uh, at his studio, it went really good. And it was we went from kind of trying out material to, okay, we're going to move ahead and make a record. And that was when uh, he actually flew over to, to Canada to work with us in British Columbia at my brother's studio. And we basically just shacked up with Mutt uh, for five months or whatever it was. And, and just lived with the guy and, and learn more. And it was, it was kind of funny because when we were working with him, he was like, okay, guys, here's what we're going to, you know, we're going to like, for instance, a different, you know, stacking vocals or whatever. And and we were like, oh yeah, we're already going to do that. We, we know that one, you know, we, like we were, we were on to his, you know, (laughs) to his game in some ways, you know, we definitely learned some, some stuff from being in the room with him for sure. But yeah, there was, it was a few humorous moments where it was like, oh, you're going to do the the, the thing. Right. And he's like, (laughs) yes, I am. I'm going to do the the thing. It was was really funny. It it was really awesome experience. It was, uh, yeah, you can't, uh, you can't, there's no substitute for working with someone like that. So did you guys have to kind of audition for Mutt? That's kind of what my brother's visit to Switzerland was, you know, was it was, you know, we hadn't done any demos or anything. There was just ideas. Most of them were either in Chad's phone or in his head. And it was so it was one of those things where, you know, he just sat down with Mutz and Mutz like just goes, okay, what do you got? (laughs) <laughs> Chad, right. and Chad was like, oh, you know, crapped his pants and then started playing, you know, a riff and a vocal. And um, that that's kind of uh, that was the uh, the genesis of something in your mouth. As soon as Chad did that, he, he, he Mutt was hooked. So in the first meeting, did Mutt say, all right, boys, we're going to recreate and we're going to reinvent rock. And this is what the no. record's going to sound like. And we're going to do these big ass <laughs> drums and we're going to be doing this. We're going to be sampling these snares and layering four on top of it. Like, did he, did he go into detail about what no. this record's going to no. sound like? He, he's, he, uh, believe it or not, you know, listening to the final product, you'd think it's a very, um, a very, uh, scientific and, and elaborate and deliberate process. Uh, this guy goes by feel more than anybody I've ever worked with. 
Uh, mm. Everything is by feel in the moment. And it, it, there's no idea he won't explore. That was one thing I found really, really refreshing where a lot of producers kind of feel like, you know, they've kind of been there, done that, done everything, written everything, know everything. And, you know, sometimes when, when an out, like a left field idea comes up, it's like, that's never going to work. Forget it. Mutt was not like that. Mutt no. would try anything. He, he was fear, He was fearless with creativity and totally going by feel. That, that's something that I really admired about the guy because for as technologically sound as these recordings are, so much of it was, was more about how it felt than anything else. Interesting. So how many takes did you have to do of bass? You know, man, that whole take story from like Def Leppard and stuff, we didn't really have, it wasn't really like that. I mean, we played it until it was right, but it didn't take us like, you know, you hear these stories about you taking like three months to get a kick drum sound or something. And, you know, and, and then, and then, you know, the drum takes took like whatever yeah. weeks, you know, we didn't really, that didn't happen for us. Um, really. I, 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 I was cognizant of that, but I wasn't scared of it. And it just never happened. Right. It never happened. Like we worked hard and we got great takes, but it was nothing like that. Mm. Like those, you know, the stories I'm talking about. Oh yeah, yeah. No, that's, totally. that's why you're asking. I, that's why you're asking is yeah. because you know, these stories but, and, and it, yeah, it's absurd, but, but, and, and I, and I don't doubt that those things happen. We, that just wasn't my experience. You know, when you guys were going to record the next albums that followed it, did you kind of base the sound off dark horse, use some of those tricks? That, that, you know, was just the, that was just that iteration of Nickelback. You know, um, it, it, how, how that, you know, like I say, it wasn't this concerted effort to, to sound a certain way. It was just, let's make the best sounding Nickelback record we can make. And, and that's what we go in and try to do every time. And, you know, it, it, with varying degrees of success, right? <laughs> yeah, totally. What was your bass rig like on uh, Dark Horse? Cause that bass tone to me is just phenomenal. Do you remember? It was, it was all DI. All DI. There, there, really, there really wasn't any. We did. We did one trick. Well, I'll share with you. We did one trick, and that is that we would play the take and edit and get it all straight, and so that every you know, so that the take was perfect. Um, and then, but what do you say that you would, would go like he'd go on the grid and like take like the note from there and like you know like crossfade it so it's perfectly matched on the grid would, and we would clean it. We would make a composite take, right? Like right. you take a number of takes and you take the best of all of them and make one hybrid take, and that and then you get the sonics right on that. But then the trick that we would do is we would take that take and then pump it through my 1970 Ampeg SVT. Uh, tower of power and just crank it and put a microphone in front of it that rearranged all the pictures in the studio <laughs> for a couple of days when we were doing reamping it was it was actually hysterically funny because mutt actually is a bass player yeah and uh and he, you know so he he knew this app pretty well you know it's a it's a pretty famous and and well-known thing and you know it's it's like the old marshals the same situation turn it up to 10 and get out of the way and get ready for you know a sound like you've never heard before and this thing it just roars i still have it here you know in los angeles i've moved it with me everywhere i've gone it's probably the heaviest piece of my life oh Jeez. So, <laughs> working with Speaking Mutt though as a bass player and he's a bass player did he did, did he elevate your performance game yes yes he did he challenged me a lot he challenged me a lot he made me play in ways that I don't normally play he made me do things I don't normally do mm. for sure took you out of your comfort zone totally it was it was what I needed to do an all new episode of the Jeremy White Show available wherever you stream catch up on past interviews and episodes on demand now subscribe so you don't miss any of it.